Welcome to lesson one of four in this tutorial, Energy Stores and Systems. We'll be covering three other lessons in this tutorial, but firstly we'll look at specification point 1.1. In this tutorial we will be covering open systems, closed systems, the energy changes within them, and finally, we will look at energy changes in different contexts. Here's a list of specification points we'll be covering in this section. It's a good idea to pause the video now and read through them carefully before we begin. We'll start off by looking at the definition of a system. In physics, we often use the word system. We define this as an object or group of objects. Whenever we talk about systems, we are simply referring to the objects that we are looking at. For example, we could look at the evaporation of water. In this system, there are various objects, including the water, the actual cooking pan, and the heat source. There are two types of systems, open and closed. Open systems are able to exchange energy and matter with their surroundings. To make this a little clearer, we'll use an example again. When water is boiled, heat energy is able to leave the system in the form of steam. As this energy gets transferred, the system is changing. Remember, changes in systems will often involve a transfer of energy. This energy can move into or out of the system. Next we'll be looking at closed systems. Closed systems are the opposite to open systems. They are unable to exchange energy and matter with their surroundings. Again, we'll use an example. In this case, we'll use the example of a thermos flask. When we pour coffee into an insulated flask and close the lid, heat energy is unable to leave the system. By doing this, we've created a closed system in which energy cannot be transferred. We've used two examples in this section to show the difference between open and closed systems. Exam questions will often ask you to apply your knowledge, so it's important that you can apply basic principles like these to a variety of different situations. We've now completed the first specification point, which means that you should understand the definition of a system. Now we'll be moving on to the energy changes in different systems. Before we look at the energy changes themselves, first we need to look at the types of energy stores that exist. As we can see here, there are 10 types of energy stores that you'll need to know for your exam. We'll be covering each of these in a little more detail. Our first energy store is thermal energy. This is the energy due to the kinetic energy of particles in a system. It's often, call, it's often called heat energy. An object with lots of thermal energy is a fire, as shown here. Now we'll move on to kinetic energy. Moving particles and objects have kinetic energy. The faster the velocity of the particles, the more kinetic energy the system will have. For example, an object with lots of kinetic energy is a moving car, but it's really important that you remember that any moving object is said to have kinetic energy. Unlike kinetic energy, chemical energy is the energy stored in the system. Here we'll use the example of batteries. Inside a battery the chemical energy is stored until it is ready to be converted into another form of energy. Next we'll be looking at magnetic energy. This is the energy due to the attraction between two magnetic objects. 
The simplest example here is to actually use magnets themselves. When we put the positive pole of one magnet next to the negative pole of another, this will make the two poles attract. This shows us that opposite poles will attract whilst the like poles will repel. We'll be exploring magnetism in more de detail later in this tutorial. GPE, or gravitational potential energy, is the energy due to height. When an object is raised above the ground, it gains GPE. The higher the object is above the ground, the more GPE it has. Elastic potential energy is another form of stored mechanical energy. It's often due to a distortion of shape. For example, when we stretch a spring, we are deforming its shape. As this happens, the spring is gaining elastic potential energy. When we let go of the spring, it will use this stored energy to return to its original shape. Electrostatic energy is due to the electric field. The charges of objects will determine this. When you put on a jumper, you can sometimes get a small electrical shock. This is because your jumper is electrostatically charged. Nuclear energy is our next type of energy. This type of energy is actually rather dangerous. It is the energy released due to nuclear fission. We can use the nuclear energy from power stations to make electricity. Our next type of energy is a little bit more obvious to understand. Light energy, as the name suggests, is due to light. The easiest example of light energy is shown here. Inside a lamp, electrical energy is converted into light energy. However, a small amount of the electrical energy is also converted into heat energy. This is why a lamp will feel hot if you are using it for a long time. Our final form of energy is sound energy. Again, as the name suggests, it is due to sound or the vibration of particles. Previously, we used a car as an example for kinetic energy. However, a car will also have some energy output in the form of sound. Now that we've covered all 10 energy types you should know, pause the video now and try to write out the names of all of them. The answers will be on the next slide. Since we've identified the types of energy stores, let's see if we can explain each one. For example, we could simply say that nuclear energy is released during nuclear fission. Pause the video now and have a go at filling in the rest of this column. Now that we've filled one column of our table, let's see if we can name any examples. Again, sticking with nuclear energy, we could say that it's the energy used to make electricity. Try to fill in the rest of the column now. Now that we've filled in the whole table, feel free to pause the video and recap the knowledge that we've just learnt. This is a good summary you can use for your revision and will come in handy closer to the exams. Using the energy changes we've just learnt, we'll now apply them to various scenarios. Firstly, we'll look at flying, and then we'll move on to collisions. We'll also cover acceleration and deceleration and finish off by covering heat. The first scenario we'll consider is flying, or in this case, throwing a ball into the air. When a ball is projected upwards, it will gain kinetic energy. As the ball gains the kinetic energy, it will rise higher up into the air, 
away from the ground. As it rises higher into the air, the kinetic energy of the ball will be transferred into gravitational potential energy. This is our first transfer. Once the object reaches its highest point, the gravitational en potential energy will all be converted into kinetic energy. This is our second transfer. As the ball gains this kinetic energy, it will fall back down towards the ground. This means that the ball has lost its gravitational potential energy and will have lots of kinetic energy. Carrying on from the previous slide, we can also consider falling objects. As the girl holds the ball in the air, it has a lot of GPE, or potential energy. Once it is dropped, all this GPE is getting converted into kinetic energy. Just before landing, the ball will have minimum GPE and maximum KE. We'll now move on to collisions. This is when a moving object hits an obstacle. A moving object will start off with lots of kinetic energy, such as this shopping trolley moving towards the wall. Once it hits the wall, the kinetic energy is transferred into many other types of energy, such as thermal energy and sound energy. If the trolley had hit a different object instead, some of this kinetic energy would have been transferred to that object, causing it to move. Now let's look at acceleration. If an object is accelerated by a force, there is a transfer of energy. Firstly, energy is required to accelerate the object. This could be chemical, thermal or electrical. The exact situation will determine the specific type of energy involved. This energy will then be converted into kinetic energy, which will be used to accelerate the object, such as this car shown here. We can use this example of a car to demonstrate both acceleration and deceleration. In deceleration, the kinetic energy of the car will be converted into other forms of energy, such as sound energy and thermal energy. Finally, we'll look at the energy transfers involved in heating. We can use the example of a kettle to do this. The kettle is using electrical energy and converting it into thermal energy, which is our desired product. This thermal energy is used to heat up the water. However, not all of the electrical energy is transferred usefully. Some of it is in the form of wasted sound energy. We have just covered five simple examples of everyday energy transfers. You should be able to apply this knowledge to six mark questions in AQA exams. It's really important that you can convey your information and ideas clearly in order to gain top marks. Now, we'll be looking at the fourth specification point in this lesson, which will cover the term work done. Work done is a very important concept to understand in physics. It is equal to the energy transferred by an action. We will learn more about this later, but it can be applied to various different topics. In the physics course, we talk about lots of similar concepts, which can be a little confusing. We will learn about work done a little later, but we can apply it to electricity, forces and heat. For now, we'll consider the term work done in relation to electricity. This is the amount of chemical energy a circuit will convert into electrical energy. It can be different in various scenarios though. In a lamp, we can convert electrical energy into light energy. As well as the light energy, some of the electrical energy is also converted into wasted energy, such as sound energy 
or heat energy. When we look at work done in forces, this is the amount of chemical energy that gets used up in doing an action. For example, the work done when someone pushes a sofa will be equal to the amount of chemical energy that is converted into kinetic energy. Now let's look at heat. When we look at heat energy, we can look at when one store of energy is converted into thermal energy. For example, in a Bunsen burner, we can look at the transfer of energy from the Bunsen into the water beaker. In this case, the thermal energy from the Bunsen is going to be transferred to the thermal energy in the water. This shows us that the Bunsen burner is heating up the water. Our final specification point looks at an important concept known as the conservation of energy. In a closed system, we often talk about the term conservation of energy. This is a very important principle in physics that states that the total amount of energy before a transfer is equal to the total amount of energy after the transfer. This also means that the total amount of energy in the system will stay the same. For example, even if the type of energy changes, the amount of energy must stay the same. If we took a light bulb, it may convert 200 joules of electrical energy into 60 joules of heat energy and 140 joules of light energy. Overall, we would still have 200 joules of energy before the transfer and 200 joules after the transfer. This is especially true in closed systems, which we discussed earlier in this lesson. We have now covered all five specification points in this section. If you'd like to revisit any of the ideas above, you can pause the video now to go back to that section. We have now completed lesson one.